Welcome in the name of our God, our Creator, who would trust humanity to be good stewards and earth keepers of all that God has created in her goodness. I'm Pastor Wanji, serving here at Eldersgate United Methodist Church, and all are welcome here. Let us greet one another with the peace of Christ together online and or if you are joining us on our YouTube channel and or watching at a different time than our premiere on Facebook, may the peace of Christ be with you. These flowers on our altar today are in celebration of Earth Day and gifted to us by Jim and Nancy Phillips. Celebrating Earth Day is a means of grace that offers us an opportunity to reflect on the goodness of God's creation and the human responsibility to steward it through worship, education, and action. Today, we are grateful and celebrate Reverend Jenny Phillips, a member who processed towards ordination in the United Methodist Church as a member at Eldersgate United Methodist Church, and who is the daughter of Jim and Nancy Phillips. Reverend Jenny Phillips currently serves as the Senior Technical Advisor for Environmental Sustainability with Global Ministries of the United Methodist Church. She will be preaching her sermon, Somewhere Better Than Here, an Earth Day sermon. Reverend Phillips also leads Earth Keepers Training for Global Ministries. Global Ministries seeks U.S.-based United Methodists to lead grassroots environmental projects that are action-oriented, anti-racist, bold, and entrepreneurial. If you are interested in becoming part of Global Ministries Earth Keepers, please check our newsletter for more information and or go to the links shared on screen as applications will be received until all spaces are filled. The training program equips U.S.-based United Methodists to launch and grow environmental projects in their communities. Topics include eco-theology, anti-racism, community organizing, and project planning. Come, let us worship God who would trust us to be good stewards of earth, for all of us to be earth keepers. Lord, we knew we would find you in gardens. We knew we would find you in water. We knew we would find you on mountain tops. We knew we would find you in wilderness. But God, we never expected to find you in a trough. In a marketplace. Among women. At dinner parties. On a cross. We, we expected, expected to, to find, find you in a tomb. tomb. And we still struggle to believe we can find you in our midst. We still struggle to believe that the matter of this world really matters to you. Still, you show up in your physical body with messy wounds to eat a real meal in the material world. You show up in a world that is degraded and scarred by the same forces that mocked and broke your body on the cross. You show up preaching a word of repentance and forgiveness to those who are broken and to those who break. Lord, we are the ones who are broken. Lord, we are the ones who break. Make us healers as you heal us. Bind us in creaturely solidarity with you and with all of creation. Impel us to permeate the world with justice, equity, sustainability, and hope. Co-create with us your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Amen.
Jen and I'm back here for another children's time and this week we celebrated Earth Day and we're going to talk about that throughout the service and I saw this sign that I really liked however I thought it was missing one point so it is the re sign rethink your choices and I found this to be something I had to do especially during COVID because while I used to always bring in my own bags to go grocery shopping, they stopped allowing that. And I was getting all of these plastic bags. And you know what? It took me a couple times, but I realized that I could have them just put the groceries straight in my cart. And I had plenty of time when I got back to the car to then pack the groceries in my reusable grocery bags. So rethinking your choices all the time. Refuse single use. These are very convenient, but they just make more garbage. And so we need to refuse single use. Think about how you can pack up a picnic lunch or your school lunch without using single use which again, sometimes this gets a little bit trickier during COVID with the restrictions, but I think that we're up for the challenge. Reduce consumption, just use less. Reuse everything. Think about how many different crafts that we've done with the toilet paper rolls. There is something to be done all the time with all kinds of different things. Refurbish old stuff. And what's old to you might be new and perfect for somebody else. Repair it before you replace it. You might not think that you have the skills, but I bet you that you can try and you might just surprise yourself. Repurpose. Be creative. Reinvent. I have seen so many people taking um, different things and turning them into beautiful things. My friend just took down her playground because her kids are in their 30s now so they took down their playground and they took that wood and they used it to build their own garden beds so repurpose everything and as a last resort recycle but when doing all of that we can't forget my favorite and i think maybe even the most important re is rejoice. Rejoice in God's creation. Because if we are taking and loving and caring and finding beauty in the world, then we will do all of these other things so easily, so much more frequently and without so much work because we'll be rejoicing in God's creation and loving our planet and wanting to do what's best. Will you pray with me? Thank you, God, for all of your creation. Thank you, God, for 
the birds and the beautiful animals and the trees and all the different flowers. Thank you for the sun and the rain and for blessing us all with all of its beauty. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Bye, church. Good morning. Please join us for the prayers of the people on this Earth Day. O oh God, we thank you for this Earth, our home, for the wide sky and the blessed sun, for the ocean and streams, for the towering hills and the whispering wind, for the trees and green grass. We thank you for our senses with which we hear the songs of birds, see the splendor of the fields, golden wheat, and the taste of autumn's fruit and rejoice in the feel of snow and the smell of spring flowers. Grant us the grace to grow deeper in our respect and care for your creation. Help us to recognize the sacredness of all your creatures as signs of your wondrous love. As people of faith, we are called into covenant. Your covenant of faithfulness and love extends to the whole creation. We pray for the healing of the earth, so present and future generations may enjoy the fruits of creation and continue to glorify and praise you. 
Now, please join us as we continue with the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The Earth Day Scripture for 2021 comes from Luke chapter 24, verses 36b through 48. While they were still talking, Jesus actually stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. In their panic and fright, they thought they were seeing a ghost. Jesus said to them, Why are you disturbed? Why do such ideas cross your mind? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I, really. Touch me and see. A ghost doesn't have flesh and bones, as I do. After saying this, Jesus showed them the wounds. They were still incredulous for sheer joy and wonder. So Jesus said to them, Do you have anything to eat? After being given a piece of cooked fish, the Savior ate in their presence. Then Jesus said to them, Remember the words I spoke when I was still with you. Everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms had to be fulfilled. Then Jesus opened their minds to the understanding of the scriptures, saying, that is why the scriptures say that the Messiah must suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. In the Messiah's name, repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of all this. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I recently read a story about a teenage boy who, like so many teens, participated in virtual schooling. He lived in a mobile home community in a small trailer that housed a large extended family. The community experienced common difficult challenges rooted in systemic poverty and health problems exacerbated by pollution and environmental degradation. The boy discovered an abandoned van on the outskirts of his town that became his own cozy hideaway. He attended virtual school from the van. It gave him the chance to see other kids, connect with teachers, and absorb new ideas. The online experience was immersive, delivering him to other planets, landscapes, and horizons. He could visit art museums, travel in space, go to the beach, talk with anyone in the world, School was an escape from the mundane struggles of his daily life, and he loved it. Now, this story wasn't a new story about how one teen was coping amid the COVID-19 pandemic. Rather, it was the beginning of a science fiction novel published 10 years ago called Ready Player One, in which spending time in virtual worlds became the de facto strategy to cope with the suffering of the real world. While the virtual worlds in the book were perhaps more immersive than ours, the basic premise felt all too familiar, particularly in the context of our largely virtual lives. With activities limited by COVID restrictions, with challenging news all around, it's a normal human response to look for a way out an escape, another world on which to set our sights. Now, humans have actually been trying to escape the suffering of this world for a very long time. Indeed, yearning for escape from suffering seems to be tied to a primal awareness that there is something better out there. It connects with the Eden of our creation story, the lush garden where all our needs and most of our wants were met. But then, like now, the humans wanted to consume beyond the limits God set for creation. The story teaches that in breaching the boundaries of the garden, 
The humans set the stage for the struggle and suffering we've been trying to escape ever since. Bible stories also offer a vision for long-term release from this world, a vision of heaven. It's described as God's house, a place of joy, shelter, and sustenance. It's hard to get there, but oh, when you do, a glorious feast and heavenly host await, not to mention a lifetime in the presence of the Lord. These visions speak to the human yearning to leave suffering, sadness, and pain behind, and to go somewhere better than here. This longing is part of who we are. The Bible is filled with stories of migrations and dreams. Throughout history, religious traditions and movements have pointed us away from this life and toward visions of other lives in this world and the next. Dreams of departure can be as patriotic as a moon landing or as deadly as an attempt to catch a ride on the Hale-Bopp Comet. Many real estate agents would be happy to lead you toward a better life, locked just on the other side of the nearest gated community. And for better or worse, some forms of escape are easier than ever, just a click away. And in fact, calling to you right now from the screen on which you're watching this sermon. Perhaps you've used that screen to escape from your current reality, from your boredom, from your frustration, from your suffering, perhaps even from your powerlessness. I know I have. I do it almost every day. My devices are the portals to the people I love who I can't hug during COVID. They're my connection to my now closed office and my kids' connection to their schools. They are my primary source of entertainment, delivering books and magazines and television shows and movies and games. They provide information and news. They enable me to engage in commerce and pay my bills and talk with my doctor all without the risks of exposure to COVID. They also sometimes stimulate my brain in ways in which my real life doesn't. Those hits of dopamine I feel when I hear a message notification are by design. Yet my constant toggling between my present and the imagined potential of the next incoming message contributes to an ever-growing sense of loneliness of emptiness, of powerlessness. For all my points of connection, there are lots of times when my devices leave me feeling disconnected and dissociated. It can feel like my life online is a wholly different existence from my life in the physical world, sometimes in a good way, but sometimes in a not so good way. Sometimes I want and feel like I need the escape but sometimes I get distracted from the things that need my attention, my work, my family, my faith, my community, God's creation. Today's scripture reading is a story about attention. The disciples think Jesus is dead and gone, body broken by the powers of this broken world. When he shows up and greets them, they're understandably alarmed, thinking they're seeing some sort of ghost. Jesus implores them to pay attention, to look carefully at his real hands, his real feet, to touch his real body, his real wounds. And then he asks for help because he's hungry. Might they have a bite to eat? And so the real person of Je the real Jesus eats some real fish, tasting and chewing and swallowing. These details matter. They're meant to draw your ear to the physicality of this interaction with the once dead, now alive Christ. In doing so, the story calls us to deep presence in the here and the now. It calls us to the reality that God is among us in this physical, material world. That the material world matters to God. That as much as we want to look for God in the heavens far, far away, God wants us to keep our attention here. Episcopal priest and author Robert Farrar Capon puts it like this. He says, there is a habit that plagues many so-called spiritual minds, 
They imagine that matter and spirit are somehow at odds with each other and that the right course for human life is to escape from the world of matter into some finer and purer and undoubtedly duller realm. In fact, it was God who invented dirt, onions, and turnip greens. God who at the end of each day of creation pronounced a resounding good at the end of God's concoctions. And it is God's unrelenting love of all the stuff of this world that keeps it in being at every moment. So if we are fascinated, even intoxicated by matter, it is no surprise. We are made in the image of the ultimate materialist. The ultimate materialist. God loves the material world so much that God gave God's only child to join the world in its deepest suffering and show that another way is possible. That despite our yearning to get out, God calls us to steward the earth, to focus on the wounded ones in our midst, to offer what we have on hand to help. This isn't really news, the idea that God calls us to attend to the needs of the world. But what is new is the extent to which our attention has been commanded and commodified for the purpose of generating profit. For millennia, people have extracted the resources of the earth and the labor of human bodies to consolidate wealth. Now corporations have realized that the real money is in our minds, and the more clicks and views and streams that draw our attention, the less capacity we have to meaningfully engage with the matter of this world. God's first job description for humans is to care for the matter of this world, the same earthly matter from which God formed us. The more we disengage from the physical realities of this world, the more we disengage from core activities of discipleship, feeding the hungry, quenching the thirsty, healing the sick, and freeing the oppressed. We can't feed the sick if we can't grow food due to arid, depleted soil. We can't quench thirst with polluted water. Disease is spreading in new and faster ways as ecosystems break down. And the loss of environmental resources of all kinds is depleting resilience and increasing vulnerability particularly in low-income populations and communities of color. Even as more and more of us seek escape from the present reality, the climate crisis is accelerating. We see this daily in Global Ministries' work in humanitarian response, as we walk alongside the church in an uphill struggle against the mass suffering created by climate-exacerbated disasters, crop failure, disease, and forced migration. When we engage in mission and ministries and lifestyles that pay little attention to their environmental impact, we perpetuate that suffering. That deliverance of people who are exploited and oppressed necessarily requires a deep engagement with the relationships between God, people, and creation. The sanctity and integrity of God's creation are central if we are to reclaim the centrality of the sanctity and integrity of creation, if we're to act on the idea that this material world really does matter, both to us and to God, then we need to begin by reclaiming our attention from the things that seek to colonize our minds with little regard for our souls. Writer and artist Jenny O'Dell is the author of a book called How to Do Nothing. Odell recommends civil disobedience in the attention economy, a reclaiming of the value of our attention and a refusal to simply give it away. She speaks to the ways in which our attention is bought and sold as we passively consume, drawing us away from the realities of the world. She invites us to train our minds to withdraw from those attention sucks and to direct our attention toward achieving the world we want. Just think of the potential in a mass shifting of attention from the virtual world to the physical world, a great act of resistance of the things that would pull us from this present. 
a collective commitment to deep engagement with the matter of matter, a life in which we are mindful of the ways in which we use the resources of our minds. Odell notes that different people have different levels of agency over their own attention, and the agency over one's attention is commensurate with one's power in the world. She says, there's a significant portion of people for whom the project of day-to-day -day survival leaves little room for anything else. This is why it's even more important for anyone who does have a margin, even the tiniest one, to put it to use in opening up margins further down the line. Tiny spaces can open up small spaces. Small spaces can open up bigger spaces. If you can afford to pay a different kind of attention, you should. This is what Jesus calls us to as well, to pay a different kind of attention to Christ's presence in our midst, to see and feel the suffering, to respond to requests for sustenance, to resist the colonization of our minds at the expense of a world that needs our stewardship now and in doing so to open up margins for others to do the same, to seek the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. May it be so.
praise be to God, we give thanks for Reverend Jenny Phillips and for her sermon today reminding us that we are all called to be good stewards and earth keepers. And today I also give thanks for the blessings of seeing once again Global Missionaries Reverend Jay Che and his wife Grace Che, who I had the privilege of meeting in the Philippines and as colleagues along with Pastor Jenny at Global Ministries, we give them praise and thanks for the services they have provided for us today. And now as we are called to go forth as stewards of the earth, I offer you this blessing that the Che family shared as part of the Let Me today. May the God who is in the water and on the mountaintops meet us here and now in this material world on this earth. And may Jesus the Christ who died and was buried in the earth, now risen, who meets with us, eats with us, bless us with peace. And may the Holy Spirit, may the Holy Spirit bind us in solidarity that we may be healers. We are each other's keepers. We are earth keepers. May it be so. Amen.